Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Academia Seneca special lecture. Now the president of Academia Seneca, Dr. Chi Hui Wong, is going to deliver the welcome remarks. Now let's welcome President Wong. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the uh, two special lectures today. Uh, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Cindy Brenner from Cambridge and Professor uh, Robert Bowman from Okinawa Institute of Technology. Uh, as I just mentioned, I will introduce both of them first and then uh, the lecture will be started by uh, uh, Professor Bowman and followed by Cindy Brenner. And then we'll have a, a discussion and questions together at the end of the two lectures. Yeah. This was designed to, uh, uh, to make sure that you, you all sit here. Uh, yeah. So Sydney was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology of Medicine in 2002, along with uh, uh, Hobbes and uh, Sultan for their discoveries concerning genetic regulation and programmed cell death. In the, night, in the 60s, uh, Sydney established the existence of messenger RNA and demonstrated how the order of amino acid in protein uh, is determined. Uh, this discovery helped to lay out the modern theory and practice of molecular biology. He also established a C. elegant as a model organism for the investigation of uh, uh, neural development, aging, uh, nerve cell function, control of cell death, and apoptosis, and identify key genes uh, regulating this process. Shinny was born and raised in South Africa, and he received his uh, uh, undergraduate master degree in science and medical doctor degree uh, there also. Uh, uh, my understanding was that he actually was more interested in molecular biology, but the field didn't exist at that time. Uh, so he, he didn't practice his uh, medicine, and he got the fellowship to uh, study at Oxford in physical chemistry laboratory, uh, where he got uh, his doctor degree there. And then he uh, spent about 20 years at the MRC, Medical uh, Research Council, uh, in Cambridge. And later on, he became a director of the genetic unit there. Now, he, uh, uh, for his uh, pioneering, I think in 1953, uh, last night we learned from Sydney, uh, in 1953, he was one of the uh, people uh, to see the, the model of DNA uh, presented by uh, Watson and Creek. I think that exposure to the DNA structure probably uh, gives him some idea about genetic code and how protein is made and, and perhaps that was uh, uh, leading to his discovery of messenger RNA. Uh, for his pioneering uh, studies, uh, Sini has received many awards and honors uh, during his career uh, in addition to the Nobel Prize, including, for example, uh, the Albert Dusker Basic Medical Research Award, Harvey Prize, uh, Kyoto Prize, Copley Medal, uh, Albert Dasker Award for Special Achievement in Medical Science, Dan David Prize. Uh, Sydney is a fellow of the Royal Society and a foreign associate member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Sydney founded the Molecular Science Institute in Berkeley, uh, California in 1996. And he was awarded by the Singapore government uh, in 2006 uh, for his uh, distinguished and strategic contribution to the development of Singapore's biomedical science. Uh, he uh, uh, was involved in the establishment of uh, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. I think uh, this will be the subject for uh, Professor Bauman to, uh, to talk. Our uh, former president, President Lee, uh, will 
was also on the board at that time uh, for the establishment of this uh, unique university. Uh, this university is under the Prime Minister directory. It's not under the Ministry of Education, so it's very, very special. Uh, and we'll, we'll hear more about this uh, later on. And uh, since then, he, uh, he has uh, maintained a very close uh, contact with the, the institution. Uh, Cindy's long and inspiring career as a scientist has not only made him one of the principal contributors to the creation of molecular biology, but extended uh, far beyond his own research to inspire new generations of young scientists. Uh, even though uh, in his 80s, uh, Sydney is still very excited about scientific research and the prospect of what can be done uh, in biology. And now uh, he is studying uh, birth bread gene and genome evolution. His work in uh, this area has resulted in uh, many new methods for uh, gene sequence analysis. And uh, this subject probably will be the focus of his talk. But uh, he, will, he will not use a slide. So I don't know how he's going to talk about gene sequence uh, without a slide. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. So let me also briefly introduce uh, 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 Professor Bob Bauman. He's currently uh, Vice President and Executive Director of Okinawa uh, Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, is in charge of all academic affairs uh, of the institute. And I heard that we actually there was a student from Taiwan uh, to study there now. Uh, uh, Professor Bauman was also uh, trained as a chemist. Uh, he received his uh, uh, PhD in chemistry uh, from Harvard University. And then he switched to, to neuroscience. He did his postdoc work at the Harvard Medical School, and after that he became a faculty member of uh, neurobiology at Harvard uh, Medical School, and he was director of the uh, graduate program in neuroscience at Harvard University, and then he also did uh, some research at the NIH and became director of the Division of Fundamental Neuroscience uh, at the NIH National Institute of Neurology neurological disorders and stroke. He served in several important capacities, uh, not only at the NIH, but also at the Food and Drug Administration uh, in the USA. Uh, he became the Vice President and Executive Director of uh, OISD in 2007. And he's also a member of the US National Academy of Science. Uh, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology uh, is an international uh, university. Uh, they offer a five-year uh, PhD program of science supported by the Japan government. And Dr. Bauman's lecture will, uh, I think, will focus on the development of uh, this university. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's first welcome Professor Bob Bauman. So thank you very much for the, the kind introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's very nice to come here. And uh, as, as you know from the, the close distance to Okinawa, to visit with neighbors. So what I'm going to do is, is give you some background this afternoon about a new university that's been created uh, in Okinawa. Obviously, that's within Japan, and I'll, I'll tell you about what it is and a little bit about how it, how it came to be. The, uh, it's Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, and it's a graduate university. We don't have any undergraduates, only PhDs. It's, uh, it's a, the intention is to go for a very high level of training and education. So we're meant, it doesn't actually say world class, it says best in the world. 
but we think that's a little too much, so we, we, we call it world class. Uh, and the goal is to contribute broadly to scientific advancement and economic development, particularly in Okinawa, and then to have this university be international. And that, uh, in order to achieve that, and I'll go a little more into this later, all the uh, teaching and research will be conducted in English, which you can imagine is unusual for Japan. So you can already tell there's something special about this. This is the island of Okinawa, and we're about halfway up on the west coast. It's, it's a very beautiful area. It's one of the most attractive regions in Okinawa. And uh, the campus is in an uh, area of uh, national forest that uh, is protected. And uh, just a simple layout, there's the research area on the campus, which consists of three laboratory buildings, and then a residential village zone here that for housing for students and researchers and faculty housing. And this all overlooks the uh, East China Sea. The architecture is uh, very special. It's, it's very well done. It's elegant. Uh, it also is extremely practical. It's a little hard for me to convey this. It's extremely practical from the point of view of interactions between research groups. A fundamental thing that I'm going to be emphasizing about OIST is that it's designed to get different disciplines to work together. And the architects for the building uh, are one of the large Japanese companies, Nikken Seiki, in a consortium with someone named Ken Kornberg, who's an architect from California. And uh, Ken Kornberg's father and brother have Nobel Prizes in, in medicine and chemistry. And so he's someone who really understands what's needed to make a laboratory work. And so I think uh, this, is, this is a special situation. Uh, he says this is his, his best. He's designed 40 laboratory buildings. He says this is the best one. I don't know if it is, but we're very happy. Now, uh, it's quite striking. And, and you can see the, the coral reefs that are outside on the coastline, the beautiful forests. I have to say, driving around here in uh, Taiwan, I'm, I'm somewhat reminded of the, uh, the, the landscape there. It's actually beautiful here, too, as well. And so the background to this, where did this, why did this thing get started? What's this all about? In Japan, there's long been an understanding that the country needs to develop an international presence in its universities. Uh, particularly in science and technology. And Japan has tried to do this many times over the, the years, over the decades, and it's never really worked very well. So this is another effort to achieve that. Uh, another point is that in Okinawa, there isn't uh, a strong economic base. And, and there was a feeling that perhaps if there was an, an institute of science and technology developed there, that this then might help to the build an, uh, an economic foundation for Okinawa. The whole thing got started around 2000. There was a G8 meeting held in Okinawa, and the principle was, was introduced at that time, and that by a couple of years later, the plan for a graduate university was included in the, uh, an Okinawa 10-year plan. And then a few years later, the Japanese Diet passed an act creating a, a type of corporation, a promotion corporation, to get things started uh, for the university. And uh, Sidney Brenner, who's here, of course, uh, was selected as the president of that promotion corporation. And so this project uh, is one in a long series that, that Sidney's been involved with over the years. He's, he's obviously well known as a molecular biologist and a scientist. But it's very important to also recognize the tremendous impact he has had in terms of beginning new ventures in science and science and technology around the world from the molecular, uh, the MBL at, at Cambridge and the European molecular biology labs, the big Singapore labs, and now the Okinawa Institute uh, for Science and Technology. So Sydney helped with the Board of Governors that I'll tell you about in a minute, get this started. And they then uh, 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 started the, found, the, the 
the actual research facilities. Then in 2009, there was uh, an, uh, another act passed to create the corporation for the university. We got our accreditation in 2011. Uh, Sydney then handed off to Jonathan Dorfan, the current president. He was previously the director for the Stanford Linear Accelerator and has a background in physics. Um, and then in this past year, in September, we got our first students. The financing right now, we're largely supported by the central government. In the future, we anticipate getting uh, more independent funding over time. Uh, the administration consists, we're a private school corporation. We have funding from the government, but our administration is the private school model in Japan, which means that we have a board of governors that has the authority. So the Ministry of Education does not have the final authority. The board of governors does. Here is the representatives of the board of governors. You'll recognize Sydney there as president. This is Jonathan Dorfan, the current president. And then you may recognize Juan Lee, who's here with us today, a member of the Board of Governors. Uh, Tim Hunt, uh, who's Nobel Prize, Tim Hunt, Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Uh, Akito, I'm a ex-president of uh, University of Tokyo. Uh, Jerry Friedman, Nobel Prize from MIT. Uh, uh, Dr. Shoko uh, Cho, who's uh, from the University of Ryukyu. Thorsten Weasel, Nobel Prize in Medicine. And uh, uh, Kurokawa Kyoshi who's a uh, leading uh, uh, person in Japanese science and technology. He, he led the recent committee that investigated the reactor accident uh, in Japan and, and received tremendous recognition for the effort he made. So anyway, this is a serious group of people with a lot of experience, and they're the ones who, who got this uh, project started. A key thing about OIST is that it doesn't have departments. The intention is to have very strong science in particular areas, but not to have a departmental structure so that the, both the students and the, and the faculty uh, can uh, work together across the, uh, the different disciplines of science. The uh, faculty members uh, have individual units or groups uh, that form the hub of this uh, activity. I've already mentioned these laboratory buildings. The, uh, Equipment is, is, is very uh, good, and as I mentioned, it's designed to promote interdisciplinary interactions. At this point, we have 46 faculty members, about to something on the order of 260 researchers. Uh, we're supposed to be international. Uh, about 60% of the faculty are international, 40% Japanese. Of the researchers, uh, about 150 or so are uh, international, so we're doing rather well. From that point of view, we're busy publishing papers. We have a lot of international uh, projects around the world, actually even have some patent applications and so on. So the research enterprise is, is well underway. The research resources are quite good without going into the details. We have lots of the things you, you have here on a smaller scale. Uh, but at any rate, it's, it's, a, it's a very substantial and well-developed research campus at this point with the library, teaching labs, and so forth that you would expect. Uh, these are, uh, uh, as I said, uh, open, I didn't say actually, as part of this uh, opportunity for people to mix, the labs are an open style, there are no walls or borders between the different research groups. The faculty sit together in a central area. Uh, the, the, all of the uh, uh, tea and, and coffee areas are, are consolidated centrally. So it's, it's designed for uh, interactions. Now, uh, we, a key element of this, the whole purpose is to uh, introduce a PhD program. And uh, what's it like? So this, has, this is going to be different, too. So not just the management of the research uh, uh, facilities. So it's an interdisciplinary program. Uh, it's based on a five-year plan, which you might be well familiar with. As I said, English is the language for teaching and research. And as, as indicated by uh, Charles Vest, who was the president of, of MIT at our inauguration, pointed out that, that this should be a different kind of institution to serve the purposes of an internationally based uh, research community. And so that's what, that's what we're trying to do with this program. Uh, 
small student to class uh, uh, ensures an excellent student to faculty ratio. We have about 100 students. We have about 50 faculty. That's two to one, two students per faculty member. So there's excellent opportunity for interaction. Uh, emphasis on uh, new novel ideas and, very importantly, customized curriculum for individualized education. That is, each student has to devise their own curriculum and their own PhD training program in cooperation with the graduate school. From the beginning, the students in, are involved in uh, rotations to get into the labs. They have to take some courses, but that they're in the labs from the start. As I said, it's a five-year program, a couple of years of pre-thesis training, some courses, rotations. Uh, they might come in, the students might have a master's degree, and they could finish more quickly than this. Uh, and then basically, there's about three years of, of research involved. The, we're trying to compete internationally with the major universities. And of course, that means we've got to do financial support like anybody else would. So we have internationally competitive packages that, that, that you would recognize from uh, certainly, let's say, the US standards that involve um, uh, personal support, uh, on-campus housing, travel support, and other, other things as well. So it's a competitive program from uh, the support of the students. We go to great lengths to try to help our students become prepared for the careers they're going to lead. We're trying to develop leaders in science, and so we want to make sure that we give uh, background in terms of how research, where it comes from, how it's done, what the purposes are, as well as uh, building a scientific foundation uh, for the students. Importantly, we want them to be connected with uh, leading universities and research centers around the world, and that would include where we are here. So we're hoping that maybe we can develop some relationships, and we're actually uh, talking about this here in uh, Taiwan at this time. Uh, uh, just a, a minor point, uh, we're using the September calendar some of you may know Japan doesn't. Japan uses an April starting date for their academic year. That doesn't work well with the Western uh, schedule. So we're, we fought our way through the uh, Ministry of Education and we're permitted to start in September, but that creates a big gap period. We use that as a chance to bring Japanese students and other non-native English speaking students up to speed in English. We send them to places for English as a second language in science and maybe some scientific background to try to get everybody up to speed. Uh, we have a lot of other student opportunities. We, we run an excellent series of international workshops and courses, uh, sometimes uh, a week long or two weeks or three weeks, different subject areas. You go to the website, you can see what they are. And in addition, we fund a whole variety of uh, studentships or internships for uh, a month or two, or up to six months, or even longer, people can come to waste and do PhDs. And so this is something that uh, we also need to support in terms of building an international community. Uh, so at this stage, I think it's fair to say that we've gotten off to a good start from the point of view of trying to create an international environment. This is where our people come from, professors, researchers, and students. And I didn't say, but in our first class, we had 34 students. And they come from 18 countries, including Taiwan. And students from Taiwan. Uh, four students are from mainland China. And, uh, uh, and as I said, we have well over 100 PA, uh, postdocs and, and, and other researchers. So it's, it's a real international uh, environment. To go back to the point of uh, we have a mission here that is related to Japan and Japan's interests. And so uh, it turns out that, that that's been going rather, rather well, too. And it, it puts more obligation on us. But at any rate, uh, we're receiving some recognition. A few weeks ago, uh, the new prime minister, Prime Minister Abe, came and visited OIS. I think it's fair to say he was, he was quite impressed with it. And in his recent major policy speech to the Diet, uh, he spoke about the development of science and the importance for the future and further development of science and technology. He said that I saw the first emerging hope in Okinawa, 
with excellent faculty members and the research environment that hoists great atmosphere uh, will be important for the future. So we were glad to hear that, but of course it puts some responsibility on us at this point, so I'm not sure. So, but, and also, uh, the, the emperor and empress of Japan came to visit us, and they had a great time. Uh, and they met the students, and while they were there, they only they had beautiful English, and they know a lot about science, it turns out. And they had a great time talking to the students and the faculty, and that went very well. So from the point of view of the hope or expectation we might have an influence on education and research and training in Japan, we're off to a, a reasonable start. And so that's a quick introduction uh, to uh, who we are on the next island over in Okinawa. And we hope that uh, some of you will come and visit if you can. And we're very much interested. As I say, we have one student now from Okinawa. And undergraduates, please take a look uh, at OIST and consider it. I think it is a good program. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Well, uh, as you know, this is my uh, first visit to Taiwan. I have flown over it many times, and I've actually stopped at the airport. But it's the first time they let me in here to see it, and uh, I think it's a uh, it's uh, very exciting to come here and see that, you know, science is really growing in Asia. Because, as all of you know, within a reasonably short time, the center of the world will be here. Uh, that's where everybody will be. So, uh, I think uh, that while everybody in the Asian area is interested in technology, science, uh, of course, uh, they are hoping for economic development. Uh, I have to tell you there are some really interesting parts of science that may not lead to very big economic developments, but it still is necessary for us to entertain. So uh, one of the very interesting things is uh, that I think we can now begin to do is to try to find out can we reconstitute the past? Uh, can we get the information to say what the world was like a long time ago? As you know, in physics you can do this. Uh, because the light that comes to you from distant galaxies also comes from a long time ago because light has, to, has a certain velocity. And so we have been able, although you would not expect it, but we have been able to give account of the creation of the universe. And of course one of the uh, great challenges is can we give an account of the evolution of living forms here on Earth? Can we learn about it? So uh, I'd like to do this because, as you know, we can now sequence genomes completely. So I have a large number of genomes that have been sequenced. More will be sequenced. And, of course, when you look at them, the sequences have no meaning. Uh, Professor Wong said, I was going to talk about sequences. Uh, uh, how can I do it without slides? It's very easy, because if I showed you a sequence, it would just be A, G, 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 C, 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 T, 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 T. It wouldn't have a meaning. Right? So, so this is a talk about ideas, not about sequences. So if you listen, perhaps I can put something into your memory system that will be useful for the future. Well, 
as you know, uh, everybody reads at the start of the human genome program, which would be change everything. And uh, those of us who knew a bit about the subject realized that it was exactly like sending a man to the moon. But let me tell you, it's very easy to send a man to the moon. It's very hard to bring him back. And so it was very easy to sequence the human genome. And it is living out there on a moon somewhere. And of course, to bring it back, we have to interpret it. We have to understand it. When you realize that for today, most, pe most people have never even looked at the human genome. The only things that know the human genome very well are computers. Uh, but computers are very stupid. They do not, they cannot generate any new knowledge. They can systematize. So, as I've often said, what we must do to tackle this problem, we must ask very difficult, but I think soluble questions of this, of these sequences. And what I'm going to do is just outline a general method that I've applied, which can lead to uh, the automatic, I think, explanation of some of the very complicated anomalies that we find in the genome. Now, you know that uh, it, you can explain almost everything in evolution uh, and change by making a hypothesis and try to confirm this. But, of course, evolution is a very interesting subject because you're always conditioned by an idea that the elephant that the organism is trying to do something and it's implemented then in a genetic program. In other words, most people like to think it's all prefigured. But you can see that it doesn't make sense for organisms to have plans. Only one organism can have a plan, that's humans, because we've got the machinery. But nobody else can plan their future. Because it doesn't make sense to say for E. coli, for example, sitting two billion years ago in the primitive soup, to say, I better not touch this gene because I may need it two million years later when I have to make actin in muscle. So you cannot do this. We must have processes which run. That's the first, the first rule. The second rule is that we are students of the germline. That means you can't take into consideration anything that happens in organisms if it doesn't get into the germline. Right? So for all we know, genes are jumping around in your brains every morning, every afternoon. But it has no consequence for us if that is not inherited. It just becomes part of something that we can't do. And that also means that we must take all our information and all our evidence must come from the genome itself. Now, this is a rule that, uh, that uh, people find uh, hard to make that discipline. Because that is the rule that you have to operate if you're trying to read this text, if I can call it this way. So let's ask ourselves, can we make a test and decide in advance a given genome has information from the past? How could we prove that it must contain information from the past? Now, of course, we know that genomes are continually changing their processes of mutation, the processes of selection for some of those mutants, and so this means the structure is very dynamic. 
And what we can do then is to simply ask a very simple question. If there is a mutation process, we can formulate what they very well know, and those are processes that convert C into G, they're called transition mutants, and they also convert G into A. That is, they convert a GC pair into an AT pair. And of course, there is the reverse process. So we can ask ourselves, is that going on still? Of course it's going on, because this happens. But is it, in fact, is the system to have been completely randomized? Because this is what you expect. If you take a set of coins and you throw the coin heads, tails, this would be the similar thing. And you could then try to make sense of any correlations you find in the sequence. But in fact, uh, there's none to be found because it's a unbiased random. Of course, now I said there are two processes. There's the process of mutation, which is, which is chemistry, really. A cytosine gets deaminated and turns into thymine or uracil. And there's the other process, which is also uh, very important and which is harder to deal with. It is when that change becomes fixed in all members of the species. It's when if I go to a set of animals like elephants, I will find that this base has this form in that organism. Of course, if I were to look at organisms where they're born, that would, many of them would be different. So we have to say, when does this become a property of the organism? And many years ago, the notion was formulated of what was called neutral evolution. So we know when a change like this leads to making a protein which may be resistant to a drug, that will be selected so that one change will become everywhere. But what happens if the change has no effect? Because then, if it has no effect, how does it become to be a state? So the first thing Kimura did is say, most of the changes are not selected. So how can they be that the cytochrome C, as he saw, uh, had one formulation in a peak, in all peaks, but if you went to the horse, you had another base powder. How can you say that the disease were equivalent, and how did it get established? So the notion of neutral evolution, and there are various ways of looking at it, had the idea that things become established by chance, or drift. There was a, it was a diffusion process. And that uh, most of them would die out, uh, but a few would become now, in this, there is a hidden assumption, as I'll show you in a moment, which is that all the genes behave independently, which is not true. They are not like balls in a basket. It's what is called linkage. That is, your genes have definite positions, it's true. These positions can change but they have neighbors, and in general, those neighbors do not change very rapidly in the evolution. So that says, what happens then if you select for one gene that's close to another, because it will come in, the neutral changes in that gene that happen to exist will come in by kind of hitchhiking. In other words, he will be dragged in because he's linked, because the only way to leave him behind is by process of recombination. 
So there is a variable which is controlled by something that's different from mutation. Right? And as you will see in a moment, that becomes extremely important in tracing things back. But uh, let's make a very simple thing. You give me genome of a bacterium. It's got 4,000 genes. And you say, is this still changing? Is it still in dynamic? Is it correct? Is, are there structures in it that I can say, yes, I can get information from the past? Right? So this is the way you do it. So in order to constrain things, which people have uh, rather neglected, they've just done generalized statistics of genomes, we go to parts of the genome that have structural constraints, namely sequences that code for protein. That means you're not allowed to have deletion rearrangement processes, which are all part of the change of genomes, they are constrained. Because if they happen, that organism is finished. It's gone. It's disappeared from the record. Now we know exactly how coding sequences are constructed, because we know that in the third position of the triplet, you can have degeneracy can have two versions. And for purposes of today's discussion, I only look at codons that have two possibilities in the third position. So, if you take lysine, the first two positions is AA, but the third position could be a G or an A. Okay. So for the purposes of, say, putting lysine in, that change is neutral, because lysine will be put in whether it's a G or a N. And I can discern a number of codons like that. They are Gs and As. And then I've got another set of what I call two-star codons, which are C and T. And these are codons like uh, histidine, which is C-A-C or C-A-T. Don't change the aminos. So suppose we ignore everything else and we just look at those. Right. Now, what we come to realize is that that's the same chemical process or mutation process because it's a, it's a GC pair changing to an AT pair. Right? And it only depends on which strand the purine or the pyrimidine is. So if it's on the Crick strand, which is the sense strand, then we get one set of codons. And if it's, of course, on the Watson strand, the other strand, we'll get the pyrimidines represented. So these are identical processes from the point of view of mutation. Can we make use? So, let's now play a game. Uh, we, collect the, we collect the gene and we'll say, just to make arguments simple, we'll say that this process has equal probability in both directions. So that in the average will be, when it's settled down, I'll have 50% gene, 50% T, uh, A, and similarly for the pyro. But let's take a protein and say we got we got ten such codons in that protein. It's just one piece. And so what we do is we count them and we will then work out what is the average. Now of course from the average you can tell the probability. So we can put the origin there, this will be 50-50. That's the equilibrium position. And you'd say, of course, anything from that is a departure from equilibrium. Right? On the other hand, it's very interesting to see that you can get 
very large departures, in any case, simply out of the statistics of the process. So let's just imagine we've looked at this thing and we find we have 20 such codons, 10 will have a G, the other 10 will have a A. So we wait, and sooner or later we'll get a mutation. That is, now we'll have 11 that has a G, and 9 that has an A. In other words, we've changed the ratio. Now, of course, if we wait again long enough to see this, we will know that it's 11 to 9 to go back to the 50-50 situation. But 9 is pretty good, and there'll be a finite problem that some of those mutations will move even a further down. In fact, you can calculate that you could get things which are 100% G and C, and in fact, for this, which is a Markov chain, you can calculate the exact distribution. You can say so much of these codons will be here, so many will be here. And that is just simply statistics and physics. So it is not true that very deviant sequences arise by lateral transfer, which is what many people have argued, because they could be there just because of the history of the system. <laughs> now, but now it comes a very interesting thing. Because I can do exactly the same for C and T codons as I've done for G and A. And I'll collect exactly the same kind of distribution. But these processes are independent. So if I take all the 4,000 genes of E. coli and I just calculate on these for the requisite codons for a given gene, what is its codon ratios? And then I will find that largely both of these are 50-50, but then the ones which get extreme, okay, just by chance. Now, if I take that and plot it on a contour diagram, now let me just explain what that is. That is, I just say, uh, all the genes that are 50-50, how many do I have? Well, I might have 500 of these. Then I go to the next band, let's just say 45-55 uh, on either side. I find a lower number and I go down all the way. So that means I get a distribution curve. And of course I get the same distribution curve in the upper dimension. And if I project that onto a plane, I get a set of contours. I just get a set of rings. Now, from those rings, independent of any other property, you can tell whether that genome is at equilibrium. Because the two axes will be independent. If the, if, the, if the gene has, if these processes are being driven by some outward dynamic, they'll be correlated because somebody's driving them down here. Now, I can take E. coli. And I can tell you, if I do this with E. coli, you can forget it. There's no information from the past E. coli. If I take uh, schizosaccharomyces and make this plot, uh, you can also forget it. Because that's completely circles of equilibrium. And, however, if I take yeast, Budding yeast makes a correlation. There are some genes that are lagging behind, so it looks like a comet of the tail. And if I take the human genome or any complex organism, I get complete correlation. Which means 
the human genome and all the other genomes are in motion. They've been driven down. And now we'll have to ask, how do they get driven down? But this is very useful for the simple reason that the proof of orthogonality extends to any two processes you may choose. So for example, we can choose another variable. Let's say, how many glycine codons have purines in the third position, and how many have pyrimidines? And when we plot that against one of the others, we don't get a set of circles, because the processes have different time points. We get a set of ellipses. Okay, but the two axes are still at right. So that represents, I think, a complete subject. Now, if you go on doing this, you will find that the geography of the genome, if I can call it that, can become quite complicated. Because if you plot other organisms, you find you have one mountain over here, and then it's running down a diagonal to another mountain over here, like a like two uh, volcanoes collected by a land. And that means that those of you are, have been moving from one equilibrium position to another, probably because some mechanism has changed. The rotational mechanism for its repair has changed, and this organism is in motion and is changed. You can also see very easily a lateral transfer. You get one set of genes that have characteristic composition, still varying, but it's a mountain over here, and then completely separated is another continent here with another set of genes, and you can show that those have come in from the outside. So these maps of genomes can be very instructive. And we can throw them away when we said you get nothing by looking at it. But what of this thing with, let us say, the human genome? Because I find when I analyze this, then in general, in general, the DNA base composition, that is A T to GC varies from one extreme uh, to the other in the same gene. In fact, one saw the dust they called isocores, and one saw the dust settles, and you can see that uh, these isocores are chunks of DNA, maybe a few megabases, in length that have a fairly uniform composition, but are differentiated from other chunks. Now, the man who, uh, a man called Bernardi, discovered this by showing that DNA fractionates according to density. And he then found that, uh, that the only, that the organisms that had such variable were mosaics of different composition of things, that those were mammals and birds. But fish and frogs didn't have this. So we formulated a theory about 25 years ago, which he still sticks to, and which is a good example of what sort of theory you should not formulate. Okay. And he formulated it. Birds and mammals differ from all the other animals because they can control their blood temperature. Uh, by temperature. We control our blood temperature. And uh, therefore he said that that was the reason why the DNA tried. That reflects this very important evolutionary step. Now, you see, this is not a good theory because A, there's no, there's no fundamental mechanism that 
that makes sense of all things. Because you don't even know the depths of the cause and not the effect. Certainly, if you had a higher blood temperature, why should your DNA be more variable? What he was positing is that nature is so subtle, they can read a very complicated language, and we poor humans must just accept that. But of course, that's, science doesn't want to do that. And so it says, this is an unreasonable theory. We must have a theory that generates the process without any change, without it being, without having to say, We've got general parts of structural models, and all of this is very important because there's some deep meaning to it. And it is so. The attempt so far, and there must be several hundred papers on this subject, is of course that many of the people uh, don't have an understanding of what happened in evolution. So let me give you the of why good birds and mammals are the same and everything else is, is different. So once upon a time with the reptile, the reptiles generated the dinosaurs. There are all sorts of other reptiles there, lizards. Now it, it became very obvious, uh, knowing a little bit about physiology, that dinosaurs had to have warm blood because they could have not generated the ability to move until their body had warmed up. They had to keep it warm all the time. It's like keeping a car running in winter, otherwise you can't start it. And it's well known that crocodiles who do not have to lie in the sun until their body warms up so they can move fast. So this calculated the, you could calculate for the size of the dinosaurs that if they were cold-blooded they couldn't even get moving, let alone catching. And of course, the dinosaurs are the ones that split into these two branches the ones with feathers, which we call birds, and the ones with fur, which we call mammals. Well, and alas, the other dinosaurs all went extinct because of this terrible event that took place at, at some part in the thing where almost everything on the planet was annihilated. So I think that uh, this means we must have a different explanation. And by the way, if you sequence the crocodile DNA, it looks like chicken DNA. That's why Jurassic Park was wrong. If you remember, they used frog DNA to repair the dinosaur. Maybe they would have been more successful if they used chicken DNA to repair. No, the crocodile looks like a chicken. The difference between a crocodile and a chicken is about the same as between us and rodents. Very similar to 90%. So I think that that is, that puts pain to that. So what I'm going to do now is to tell you what I think is the theory that explains this. And it turns out to be very similar to uh, what we believe is happening in cosmology. So here is the thing. First, without giving you the evidence in detail, I can prove that these genomes had a singular origin. See, because if you have a distribution, they could start anywhere, be moving in all kinds of I can prove from other things that the direction is only one, at least for the human genome. 
That is, it's moving from very high GC to very low GC. Now, you ask yourself, how can that happen? So what has happened is that uh, the genes have started in this form, and there are a few archaic genes that is by definition, all the genes in, the, in any genome are all the same age. I mean, that's obvious. It's a tautology. But some have an ancient structure, and some have structures that change in accordance with the time. And the ancient structure was to have small genes with small introns and very high genes. Then what happened is that some of these genes got linked, linked to other genes which were, had become selected. And so these chunks got driven downhill. And you can, for various other indications, work out for the human genome exactly when that happened because these fixation events can be dated from the kinds of uh, transposable sequences that have landed in them. So for example, we can date all genes that have changed during mammalian evolution uh, by looking at typical mammalian transposals, which you don't find we can date even better all the genes that moved while we were all primates. Okay, because now we have sequences that have only common to primate sequences. So these act then as other markers. So what you have to imagine is uh, we have not only the expanding universe, but we have the expanding genome has expanded throughout the entire course of history over this long period of time. Some of the genes that have been left the way they were maybe uh, half a billion years ago. But some have changed accordingly. Some have become very big. They're very high in AT, showing they've had many rounds of fixation. And that's what gives the vector. And the reason why there are chunks, because we can remove all these chunks and study linkage relationships, it's a kind of evolutionary genetic mapping. And we can then reconstitute the chromosomes of the original organs. Okay. So that is the upshot of this. And, uh, whether this will help to cure many diseases, I don't know. But in fact, I think we need to have that because that challenge. And what I do hope, you will make some room here in all the institutes for some talented young people that want to try and answer these questions for reconstruction. Because I think it's important for, for science itself. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much for the wonderful lectures. And now we would like to take some questions. Yeah. Uh, you, you can uh, ask any question about the Okinawa or the human genome. <laughs> it's very, very different type of lectures. <laughs> any, any questions? It's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a question. Just get it started. Uh, it's Where very, it? oh, very okay, interesting yeah. that uh, you think about uh, the composition of the genome, 
is due to moving from a low GC to a high GC to low GC. Uh, do you, can you speculate why moving in that direction and what determines the GC content of any species? Well, I think a lot would depend on, uh, on you know, what form uh, the original organisms were. Because we're talking about a time when there weren't really the sort of animals that you think the uh, fish, all vertebrates have the structure. So the structure evolved into this form before the vertebrates, which means before half a million years ago, 500 million years ago. So, so now we're looking at a time when there, were no, there are no fossils. There are no geological fossils, or very few because there were no hard parts to prison. And therefore we have to reconstitute it, so to speak, from the fossils in the genome. I think that the reason uh, to do this is that uh, it looks as though high 80 is the end of the road. Uh, and that's probably in the nature of how the repair processes. See, because the actual rate of change of one into the other, uh, you can have a mutation, you can have an deamination of cytosine. It turns to a urosol. Right? And then there are repair mechanisms that don't like to see urosol in DNA and they cut it out. Uracil is a special enzyme who recognizes this chemistry can find one uracil in DNA. It will then excise it and then it's replaced by repair replication. So that means the G always gets a C back again. So only in such cases that for all of the changes there are these special things. There's also recombination and that has different properties as well. So what I think has happened is that most of the variable repair is due to recombination. And I think then that recombination falls and so you get the full value of the change. So, so to speak, the actual forward rate changes. Now, calculate this exactly and I have plotted the rate of basis it's, it's, it's quite extensive work because there's no computer program that can do this satisfactorily so I take uh, genes from let us say man and mouse and I also take the gene from uh, let us say cows bovine because the cow separated off earlier than that, the second separation. The cow tells me what was there originally. And then using that information, I can give you an absolute measurement of the probability that the space, what is the probability that the space changes in one genome as against the other. Because the standard rule is to divide the changes by two and allocate them separately. Turns out that's wrong. Because if you do it this way, you find out that mice are evolving three times faster than humans. Right? Which means that in order to make consistency, we have to put the mouse into the future. So the mice are, according to the humans, clock. The mice are a hundred million years in the future. Right? And therefore, once you get these absolute measurements, because what you then begin to realize is, so to speak, every gene is moving with a different velocity, in all, in, even in the same organ.
And the only time when that velocity is similar is when they are tightly linked. Okay, because then it makes sense. You, you might as well consider two genes which are tightly linked as one gene twice the size. And even if you look at big genes, you can see where the one part of the gene is different from the other, and that tells you there must have been recombination in between them. So we have to reconstruct it in detail, and that's why statistics doesn't account for. And once you do this, then you begin to get the picture that uh, all new functions, say functions you don't find in fish, but you find in humans, they are all high AT. All the functions you find which are common, so-called housekeeping functions, are high GC. And once a way of saying it, well, we know they work, there's no point in changing the sequence. When you have to create new function, you will get this motion. So we can make a, a history. The only difficulty is to put it on an absolute scale with reference to the fossils, but I think that that will come as well. Then we get a good picture of this. Sorry, but it's a long answer to your question. So what is, what is the organism like with the IGC content? It doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. No, amphioxus, the puffer fish, fugu has a high GC. Streptomyces are very high GC, in fact, they're very difficult to sequence because essentially they just have the least aid they need. Though it's very it's interesting to look at these consequences because you can get characteristic signatures for these, you know, depending on the organism. Also tells you a lot about protein structure. So for bacteria which are high AT, the only glycines that are retained of that proteins are those that are structurally important. All the others have changed to something which can tolerate. You know, like glycine can go to a serum for example, with less gene. So that says something, you know, about protein. Questions? Okay, yeah. This is more general questions for Sydney and Robert, if I may call you so. I'm very glad to see the global institutions in Okinawa. So you also said you have one child, high one student. Can you give us uh, what do you see any strength uh, of a Taiwanese student? That's one thing. And second thing is, uh, can you also give us some uh, advice based on your success research life? Um, how can we do further as a researchers? You do the first. Yeah, yeah. maybe I'll find out <laughs> what they say. So, the, the Taiwanese student that we have, uh, actually like our other students, <clears throat> is first of all very well prepared. That is, the, the educational system provides an extremely strong foundation in Taiwan. I think it's, it's also uh, important that uh, he's not afraid to, new, to do new things. And that's, that's a more difficult thing to do. A lot of people build up a strong academic record, but a smaller percentage of people have this ability to take a new step, to try something new. And I think uh, that's a characteristic of, of this person. And so uh, I think that in, in terms of what would make a difference, I think that's what I would emphasize. And that's what we're hoping to introduce into the program, to help people, to support people, to develop their own ideas uh, for the future. And he's, he's, a, he's on a, a great track to, to start this. Well, I think the important thing to realize is, uh, is that all the great 
I've been the same for the last hundred years. Most of them, certainly in the last 60 years, they've all been created by either single individuals or very small groups to make the whole of computing machine. But the theory and the practice was single individuals and big institutions of one mind. So it seems you have to ask why are some institutions that can in effect produce what are called disruptive technologies that change. What do they have? And one such institution is Bell Labs. And well, the interesting thing is it was open. Open. You didn't have to ask permission to go and visit people. And the idea that you have an open structure, people can get together to I also said, and what is also important is immigrants. Now, I don't mean immigrants from different countries. I mean that too. But it's immigrants from different fields. It is, when you get people that come from engineering or technology, they actually have different ways of treating them. And I think what is called, you know, the professional closure very sterilized. You know, if everything's done the same. And the third ingredient in my experience is to be young. Now, one good thing about being young is that you didn't know. You see, people like me are no good at science and more. I know them too much. But young people who don't know enough, they will, they will try to they would look at things in a different way. So I think you need an environment which fosters that. And I'm afraid now all our labs, certainly in biology, certainly the ones I know in chemistry, is they just depend on slavery. You know, you just have postdocs that each give them a class, and they got into it for the full program. We need much looser structure, but uh, I'm afraid uh, everybody now is structured for labs. Uh, I think it's very hard to be to do initiatives. And I think that we will lose something by this. By this uh, this is no doubt about it. If you have a big, massive project, like to build a bomb or you need factory and I think there's whole room for individual contributions and individuals just to have different ideas and to be able to try and if necessary fire then you learn something that way that you will not learn any other way just follow the same Science don't get out of um, what is the more managed style, bureaucratic style of doing research. That's a maybe we should have. Uh, we should allow this. Uh, you're not going to be able to do this. Uh, and I know some years ago I gave a lecture. America people wanted to hear what were my ideas about science. So I said, okay, here's the title of my lecture. It's called The Casino Fund. The Casino Fund. Everybody who gives money for science takes one percent, gives it to the casino fund, and writes it off to get some So who runs the casino fund? give it to me to run. I'm a successful gambler. I've got good evidence for it. I also think I have a nose for people. So you let me choose the 
I gave this lecture and I cannot tell you. There was an uproar from the All the business people said, how can we ensure payback on this one percent? They prepared to lose half, 90 percent. But they, one percent would have to be paid back. And all the academics said, we must have peer review. Must have peer review. Now peer review is regression to the mean. And the mean is, not only the mean, it's mediocre. And what you're looking for is not regression to the mean. You want to be out there with people in the fourth standard. So I think we're now, you know, we're lacking that sort of uh, business. You know, I think what you need is is loose gangs. And most of the sort of is a loose gang. People can get together and do research. There's loose gangs and a couple of really courageous people, commanders, you know, who prepare to jump out and do this thing. If you do that, you'll get a change. But if not, we'll just get more of the same. And it won't be interesting. So I think we need institutions that uh, should practice a little bit of well, You also mentioned about customized, customized curriculum. Okay. Yeah. What, what, what is that? This for a student? Yeah. So, for example, if, if someone comes in, let's say it's in neuroscience, and there's a fairly obvious direction. Uh, that might not need much customization. And they say they want to add, for example, uh, a, a kind of quantitative analysis that they need some help from the physicists. Or they're going to do a certain kind of imaging that is only now being developed, some kind of optical imaging with super resolution microscopy. Uh, and they have a biology background. But in order to make that into a coherent project, it's got to be an individualized uh, design. And that's, that's what we're, we're trying to have. You, you have to maintain the, the core professional quality of, of the, the effort. But to be able to bring new elements in, requiring each, each student to participate and help do it, that's the I also have a question regarding the Okinawa Institute. And it's really fascinating to have this North Department barrier. But I'm just wondering, uh, when you give students the degree, do you keep a certain, let's say, PhD um, certain expertise or certain field? Uh, another question regarding a, a course. And uh, President Ong just mentioned about the courses. So a student, does he require to Selects certain specific courses in order to uh, finish the, this, this degree. Because it's also a relationship with them. his or her future to look for or develop their careers. Thank you. Yeah, I left out a very important point that each each of the students from the from the day they arrive has an academic mentor. These are always senior people who have a variety of, of experience that seems relevant to the interests of that particular student. That academic mentor stays with the student the whole time there at OIST. And when the, the student is choosing their courses, there has to be a discussion, maybe with the help of other people, as to what makes sense. And uh, so it, it, it has to be, this is part of this individual design, it has to be well rationalized terms of that particular person. The degree itself, we debated this, the degree itself says PhD in science. Then you can have a little bit of writing down at the bottom with a you know, specialization in neurobiology or physics or, or, or whatever uh, that is appropriate to that particular individual. That's not a new idea. So I, I was at Harvard Medical School 
and every PhD at Harvard Medical School, it's about uh, around 80 a year, 100 a year, something like that, gets a PhD in medical sciences. And then it says other things, something about immunology or biochemistry. So we, we decided to do that to help avoid the crystallization of the equivalent of departments, even if you don't call them departments. If you start, we started with specialization in neuroscience and cell biology and so forth, and eventually we took it out. So that, that was the thought. Behind. Yeah, Dr. Based on your experiences of reading the human genome, could you say something about how the human genome looked like one billion years from now? Yeah. I, I give you complete insurance. It'll still be there. Because genomes take a long time to do that. But with the humans will be there, I don't know. Because we are no longer subject to natural selection. That's the problem. Because you see, if cold weather comes, then organisms like ourselves, the only one that would survive is those that grew fur. But we, of course, go out with the animal with the on its skin. So that's what you do. You do what biological evolution hundreds of thousands of years to accomplish you can do it in an afternoon by technology. So humans have to be separated. So how do you how do you bring the epigenetics into the evolution? I don't bring epigenetics into anything. It should be left out. It doesn't out. mean anything. Doesn't mean anything. I'm against the epigenetics. It's, it's a lot of, it, it's a phenotype that's expressed on the DNA. So it will be like anything else, it'll have to be a biochemical process. It's nothing magic. In fact, everything in development is epigenetics. Because, uh, but now everybody wants to have a special meaning that, you know, it's kind of, in your constitution is the amendment of the constitution at the time. But I think this is not, it's, it's just, I don't, I think the people know what they want to do. They want it to be sort of a But it doesn't. Okay. You can do proper experiments to test this, but they haven't yet been done. Yeah. Uh, is Isang Huang asking Professor Bauman, and I'm quite impressed by the OIST situated in a very scenic and, and locus. And I'm just wondering for the PhD student and also for the um, world leading scientists working there, it seems to me that they would have very few distractions from like the urban life or cultural events. Do you think it's also and, and would it happen in, in, in OISD then? And would it be good? And would you comment on this? Thank you. Yeah, so the first necessary thing is a pub. Well, we're funded by the Japanese government. So they said no pubs. <laughs> So, fortunately, we're near a, a neighborhood, and there was a little pub. It's doing very well. And so, uh, you've touched on a, a key point. Yes, it is a beautiful place. It's fantastic. But it is isolated, and we think about that a lot. And uh, at one point I didn't emphasize, I showed a picture of some sort of village. And I said, this is where people live. That's not quite right. That's where half of the people live. We intentionally designed the 
campus housing to only be sufficient for about 50% of everybody, 50% of the students, 50% of the researchers, and 50% of the faculty. That means the other half has to live out in the Okinawan community somewhere. That's by design. And then that helps a little bit with the point that you're raising. Some people live outside somewhere, and then they have other contacts for things to do. And, uh, but it, it, it is an issue that Naha, the capital city, is about a million people. And so that's a very substantial city with, with the, the kinds of activities that students and, and researchers and others would be interested in. And there are some other communities. Uh, but that, that, that the overall community is a big issue. One more thing I would add that we knew would be a challenge is that any university is, is a complete community. That is, there may be scientists there, but there are also people in the humanities, and there are also people in the social sciences and other areas as well. And so we've gone out of our way to, in our uh, facilities, to make it uh, very comfortable, easy for people to come and perform music. We have art exhibits all the time, and so forth. Uh, and even though we're a little community, that's part of the kind of question you're asking. We, we've got to build it in. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I first have to say that I'm very happy to hear this lecture. And I would like to, to hear about the meaning of job DNA uh, for evolution, if, if any. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Everybody has been following this big argument for the ENCODE point. The ENCODE people said uh, all the DNA is functional. That's what they want to prove. But all the people who said there's a job uh, didn't know what they thought. Everything has a value. I think what you, you have to realize, you have to be objective about this. So, so we simply look at the genome and say, say the processes that increase the amount of DNA are whatever process you do, and the processes that decrease the And as long as the processes that increase it, that do, do not injure then uh, they will be tolerated. It was very difficult to put the DNA. And they're being attacked by other pieces of DNA all the time. And now we come to understand how bacteria have invented mechanisms to prevent other DNA from turning to them. Very elaborate this process. So that's all you have to say is that when this DNA People don't like the idea that there's a job. So I want to give you a good example, which comes from real life. I think in one of the articles they quote Every language distinguishes between two kinds of rubbish. There's the rubbish you keep and the rubbish you throw. They have two different Japanese, the rubbish you keep is garbage, and the rubbish you throw away is called gold. In English, it's junk, and the rubbish you throw away is garbage. Now, now humans collect junk, there's no doubt about it. And of course, uh, you know, they say fine things, nice box, a line that you have. I never forget that. One day I'm going to make a book out of something. Then, of course, the box accumulates, papers off the tickets. And then, of course, uh, if you have a wife, she is a beautiful uh, example of natural selection, golden and so She comes down like that. 
day, and she converts your junk into bulb. She throws it up. And when you say, what happened to my box? She said, you'll never make this. Go out and buy a book. <laughs> not so. so we do do this. And I think, so, so the idea that everything is going to be fantastic doesn't take into consideration one very important Nothing is achieved. If you've got to do something specific, you're going to have to pay for it. You'll need some kind of sequence information. Whether you build a, a protein in different or whether you build uh, some other device, you switch off that. You'll only get to if there is strong selection. That is why, if it doesn't matter, it doesn't harm the organism, it just means that. Well, that's what people find very, very difficult. And they want to explain it. When they discovered microRNAs, I went down saying that the DNA is 97% junk. I said, so this guy went to me. He's one of the big proponents of me. And he said, now what do you think? I said, I'm prepared in the light of new evidence to change my instrument from 97% to 96.8%. So I think that, that, and you ought to not allow to have junk to your head like I could to plan to build a book. You can't keep this job because you say, I may need it to do some special kind of new knowledge and I'm going to get the You can't do that. So once you get this, these processes, you will expect to understand why you want to do it. I mean, you know, the alien sequence is an archive inside. I want to make comment on the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. The uniqueness of this institution is government provides the money to a private school being run by the board of governors. So a university is good freedom because run by the board of governors. But money was coming from the government. So this is unique. You don't find it anywhere. And Compared to Taiwan, we don't have that kind of freedom, and that is one big difference. It's a key point. My question is for the Dr. Cindy Brainer, and it's very uh, simple and uh, maybe a little bit naive, which is as, as follows. Uh, does it, uh, does the, like, uh, no, does no, no GC content give the human being uh, evolutionary advantage, given my concern that 
the load, the, the, the high, the GC base pair has uh, three hydrogen bonding, and the AT base pair has uh, two G, uh, two hydrogen bonding in the structure of the double helix. So maybe the low GC content may destabilize the human uh, stability. Uh, could you, the, the Dr. Werner, uh, give a comment on this? Thank you. Okay, so let's have the last question. So, yeah, yeah. I would like to have a question to Dr. Sinebrenner. Uh, from the biologist's point, how do you think the radiation damage to the gen human gen genome, I mean, uh, were, were this kind of damage has a large impact on the recent issue on the 311 power plant blast and the recent hour debate on the uh, nuclear power plant should be built up or not. Thank you.
this card is there. What I need to do about this card, but in fact, you should not consider this gigantic or a huge threat to human life. Probably eating at McDonald's is more threatening. Okay, so that's an uh, uh, end here, and please join me to thank uh, Sydney and Bob again for the wonderful lectures. <laughs>